Hello, and welcome to Ask the Expert. As we enter the fourth quarter, we'll be turning our attention in this series to year-end processes. Today's topic will be talent, performance, and succession, and we'll be examining it through that lens. We have two additional sessions that are planned for the remainder of the calendar year. Our next session will be on merit and bonus. And finally, we'll round out the year with a session on year-end processing for payroll. If you're interested in those two sessions, please stay tuned to our website and LinkedIn for announcements on times and dates. We'll be following our standard agenda this morning. So for those of you who don't already know me, my name is Madeline Countess. I've been with Collaborative for about eight years in the HCM implementation space. I have 10 years experience in the ecosystem and seven years as an HR practitioner. I'm joined today by several of my colleagues. So first, let me introduce Marcella Lazardo. Marcella? Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Madeline. My name is Marcel Luzardo, for those of you that don't know me. Um, I've been in the Workday ecosystem for about eight years already, specializing in talent and performance um, in collaborative for the last six years. Um, so excited to have the session. Thank you for having me. All right, thanks, Marcella. Now let's hear from Sarah Gardner. Are you there, Sarah? Yes, can you see me? Okay. Thank you, Madeline. Go ahead, Sarah. My name is Sarah Gardner. I've been at Collaborative Solutions for six years and plus going and several years in the HR ecosystem as well. I'm a managing consultant at um, in the HCM practice delivery, um, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, Sarah. And now we have Zach Cylinder. Zach? Thanks, Madeline. Good morning, everyone. My name is Zach Cylinder, and I've been in the Workday ecosystem for two and a half years here with Collaborative in our organizational change and training practice. And I'm happy to speak with you all today about best practice for talent performance um, and the end user considerations around these topics. All right, thanks, Zach. So now before we jump into our prepared material, we'll talk just a little bit about Collaborative. So for those of you who don't know us or are thoroughly familiar with Collaborative, we are an HR, financials, and student transformation consultancy. We are the longest tenured Workday partner in the ecosystem, one of the original four founding families, if you will. We're, we've got a lot of great stats that we could share with you, but I just really wanna focus today on our 98% customer satisfaction rate, which we are very proud of, and two brand new great place to work awards that we have recently won. So one for women and one for millennials. We truly believe at Collaborative that happy consultants make happy customers. So we're always thrilled when we can confirm how great our culture is and what a wonderful place Collaborative is for our consultants. So now let's jump into our material. We're gonna be talking about talent, succession and performance today. So we're going to start off with Marcella and just give a brief overview of, of really what's it all about. So Marcella, can you help us to understand the benefits of talent, performance and succession and why we might use them together or separately? Absolutely. Um, so one of the main uh, one of the main benefits of using all three areas together is essentially the ability to find, retain, and develop those top talent individuals within your organization. We have several tools within Workday, varying from reports um, to fields that we could capture. Um, my personal favorite is the Fine Workers Report. It might be the simplest report, however, it is the most effective in actually pulling out those um, top talent individuals. It helps you appropriately filter through your workforce to find that specified talent that you're looking for, whether it's ranging from work experience, uh, potential assessment, so those high potentials, um, or those individuals that um, um, are in flight risk. 
Um, you can definitely, you can pull and compare workers to each other, varying from performance ratings to compensation and um, comparing their skills and experience to one another. Um, and based on the selection or the individuals that capture your attention, you can go ahead and move them into a succession plan, a talent pool, and even initiate a development plan in order to um, engage and further develop that employee. Great, thanks. So I did forget to mention, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat and um, we, will, we will get to them at the end, time permitting. Uh, so thanks, Marcella, that was super helpful. I think what I'm most curious about is as we think about the adoption life cycle, what do we typically see and what do we typically recommend in terms of customers adopting this functionality? Should we go succession first or do we need to do something else prior to adopting the succession functionality? So one of the uh, I can take this one, Madeline. Okay, great. One of the things that we really like about talent performance and succession is that it is able to be deployed independently or together. So as Marcella just explained, there's a lot of advantages that you can have when you deploy the three together or different components of the functionality together in different combinations that suit your business needs. So really to get the most out of these different you know, modules and functional areas, we typically see to get the most out of this process at a high level deploying talent first. So what this is going to do is it's really going to set the stage as part of either your phase one HCM deployment or as a phase two to support um, different uh, other phase two implementations that you might be doing like learning or uh, recruiting. And so you really get to set the stage to identify worker data you know, fill in the gaps with what you're currently missing in your legacy system, and really get to understand your workforce. So it's really good starting point to deploy talent, at least at, as part of their deployment or as the first phase of it. Um, so getting that qualification experience, really getting to understand your workforce um, all in one unified system. That's one of the really, one of the main key advantages with Workday. From there at a high level, then we can focus more on um, performance management. So most commonly performance reviews, but like what Marcella was saying previously, you know, focusing on other ways to help build your workforce based on the data that you're already collecting. So your development plans, really focusing on workers' career aspiration and what they're looking for to you know, help support your business, but also get the most out of their career. And then from there, with those components in place at a high level, we look for, you know, generally impl implementing succession planning. So once you understand your workforce, you understand how they're performing, what their potential is, really understanding what gaps you have in your workforce in terms of employee readiness to fill in internally, um, you know, or if you need to implement or utilize recruiting to bring in someone externally from the system to help ensure that if, you know, someone leaves the organization or transfers to another job, that there's someone there ready to pick up that position and keep your business moving forward. Thanks, Sarah. That's super helpful. Um, so if I think about my year-end processes, um, most of my customers are getting ready to run their performance process right now. And, and I'm sure that there are some questions there. So I'm hoping you can share with us some of the general considerations. And specifically, I think we want to understand what's the difference between carryover and consolidation and how is that going to impact my performance reviews as I consider launching them for the upcoming performance process? Absolutely. One of the things that we want to really make sure that is understood is that these are two different processes that you can use to help supplement your employee review planning and, and coordination. So what it's really meant to do is help bring previous review content that you've launched at the beginning of the year and bring it into your current or your target review. Um, so if you think about from a performance review perspective, um, some of you um, may have deployed goal setting as part of one of your 
you know, quarter one um, tasks. And so if you think about, you know, how do I get those goals, you know, as they've been um, set throughout the year into, um, into my end of year annual process, perform, uh, using the performance review carryover and consolidation can help do that, as well as part of other reviews that you might be using. Uh, so bringing forward uh, answers to different questions or ratings from different sections into your end of year process to help build that story, reduce manual entry. So if you have, you know, a lot of data that workers are trying to, you know, input, um, you know, they've already started to do that work and it's just reviewing, seeing if there's been any changes and then, um, you know, helping that, you know, helping them make their decisions, but also reduce the effort that it takes them to complete it. So you can get a more positive uh, completion rate, which is always important. Um, so, you know, the difference between the two is that, um, you know, carryover is really meant to be used for just the last completed review. And consolidation is looking at the different reviews that you might have had throughout the year and bringing them into the year process. So as you think about the different types of reviews that you want to do, it's important to consider what content you're going to be launching when so that you can make sure that they're going to be pulled into your reviews, as well as think about the different rating scales that you're using. So we really want to make sure that those are aligning. Um, so if you're using a three-point scale at, in one review at part of a process and then and your annual review, you're going to be using a five-point scale. You know, thinking about how you want to structure those and if you want to align them to just one scale. And then also think about the different types of sections that you want to incorporate. Um, carryover and consolidation isn't available for every type of section, and they're each independently available for a different types of sections as well. So for carryover, um, we see this with the accomplishments, competencies, goals, questions, and responsibilities sections, whereas um, consolidate is just accomplishment, goals, and responsibilities. So as you're thinking about the different types of sections that you're getting ready to pull into your annual review, you know, which ones are going to be able to use which type of functionality um, and which um, reviews at the beginning or onset of your processes so that they can successfully carry over. And of course, one of the things that we highly recommend is structured testing. So as you go through and you plan out the dates, making sure that you have scenarios set with specific review periods so that they can actually you know, move the content forward as expected. So making sure that your periods are outlined and you understand the content that should be moving forward. Because even though it's available, you might only want it for a specific type of item content like um, your goals or your uh, competencies. So there's a lot of flexibility um, to be used here with some limitations. So testing that is going to give you the best understanding of how that's going to look based on your business needs um, and also help prepare your users for what they should be expecting as well. Okay. Wow. That's a lot to think about. <laughs> and I know that from my perspective, um, you know, I'm often on the advanced comp side of this. Um, so, so as I think about setting up that advanced comp process in a pay for performance type of situation, I wondered if you could share with me some of the things that we should be thinking about from a talent and performance perspective lens. Absolutely. Um, one of the key things um, and things that you're probably going to hear coming out of this session is coordination and timing of your events and your reviews. Um, so one of the things that you really want to make sure that you're thinking about is the order of uh, your performance review in, in terms of how it aligns with your compensation review periods. We really need to make sure that your performance review period end date falls within the merit or, or bonus process period end date um, because we need that data to be able to fall into the, the review at the appropriate time. Um, otherwise, your merit process is going to look at a different review and might not pick up the correct rating that you're looking for. And then speaking about ratings, um, one of the things you also want to think about in terms of alignment um, is the scale that you're going to be using. So similar, similarly, um, on a performance review scale, if you're going to be using a three-point scale um, and then your merit review, you're going to be using a five-point scale or vice versa, you want to think about what that's going to correlate to and is it better to use just a single scale from a user experience perspective as well to avoid confusion. Um, 
from a manager's perspective as that user, you also want to understand and help coordinate if that manager's review um, rating is going to be the final review rating or if it's going to be uh, able to be updated as part of the process. If it's going to be able to be updated, you want to think about as part of your performance review process, incorporating a step to update those review ratings from the merit process so that the most so what you see reflected on the merit is going to ultimately show in your reporting of the performance review process. And that's important because one of the things that um, you know, may not be commonly known is that if you if your manager inputs an updated rating in the merit process, it's not going to write back to the performance review process. It doesn't, at this point in time, dynamically write back. Um, it doesn't feed back. So making sure that you understand the process if you're going to be allowing managers to do that as part of the in-progress review. And if it doesn't fit within your timing of the review, um, making sure that you think about you know, coordinating with your HRIT teams um, the ability to use a delivered web service to update those ratings at the end of the process or your merit review cycle so that your reporting can also stay up to date as well. So a couple of things to think there about coordinating your, your processes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I know that, you know, in the past when I've worked on advanced comp, it's all about the dates. You know, the dates for the advanced comp process, the dates for performance, everything has to line up. And, and you really have to be careful about that. So thank you for sharing all that. I think that will really be helpful for me as I go forward in some of my projects. Um, I did have one other question for you about sort of general considerations. Um, we wanted just to spend a few minutes covering the difference between succession plans and succession pools. Absolutely. Um, so succession plans and pools are one of those things that kind of comes at the end of having deployed everything else, as I mentioned previously. Um, so when you really get into that established thought about, you know, what your succession strategy is going to be, Workday offers two different types of approaches to succession in terms of succession plans and succession pools. And they're very different, um, but they're meant to serve the same purpose. Um, so succession plans are position based. So you're actually going to be, um, you know, putting a plan onto a specific worker's position, whereas succession pools are job profile based. So if you think about your job catalog, you can have multiple workers assigned to a job profile. So that pool can reach more workers than just a single position. So if you think about it, um, you know, typically what we see from a uh, a succession strategy is that you use succession plans for your one-to-one -one, uh, job uh, qualifications. So if you think about your leadership, you usually have one person who's a CEO, you usually have one person who's you know, a director of uh, learning and development, for example. But it's very easy to use succession plans to specifically target those positions. Um, the succession pool, if you think about your many-to-one scenarios, it's really good for kind of mid-tier and down. If you think about workers where you have a lot of turnover, where you hire a lot of the same type of worker, your laborers, um, you know, your retail staff, um, where you can kind of have that, you know, lift shift of people between positions. So that's really, um, you know, where we kind of recommend the break between succession and pools. Um, and if you're using position management, you can use both. But if you're not using position management, you are limited to just the succession pools. Um, so that is one thing to consider. Um, you know, if you're a new customer in terms of your of your strategy for your staffing model. Okay, that's super helpful, and I can definitely see how for some of my customers. So think like maybe I had a, a retail customer in the grocery business succession pools would be a great way of identifying potential store managers. There's many of them and, and they aren't specific to a store, um, but that would have been a great way. So I'm glad to hear that that functionality is available now and we have the opportunity to leverage that for our customers who have that type of situation. All right. So I think next we're gonna turn our attention to calibration and we're gonna have Marcella walk us through some of the things that are important to really understand about calibration 
we know that Workday offers calibration for both talent and performance. So I think first, let's start off with the differences between the two. Sure. Um, so um, the main difference between talent and performance calibration, I would have to say there's two things that really go hand in hand. Uh, first off is a tr typical timing that I see. Performance calibration obviously occurs during a performance or an annual review process, and a uh, talent usually goes hand in hand with a talent review. Um, the other main difference that goes between the two types of calibration is typically the number of accesses within uh, that either program consists of. Um, like I mentioned, performance calibration typically goes hand in hand with annual performance review, um, and it typically consists of a single axis um, being performance rating. During the performance calibration conversations, the tool and work they helps facilitate such conversations um, with the innovative functionality of dragging and dropping to support um, the quick updates while you're in process of having these conversations. Performance calibration is meant to um, support rating distribution. So typically I hear a lot of clients asking for a bell curve distribution. So that would help um, just to ensure that results are not skewed between managers. And it's meant to be a projection of how the employee has performed. Um, on the other hand, we have the talent calibration. Usually, it's typically outside of the performance process, and I typically see it during a company's um, talent review. Um, so this type of calibration usually consists of two axes, which are typically performance and potential. Like performance calibration, talent calibration is meant to support internal conversations. However, this type of calibration is meant to be more forward-looking. Uh, the typical outcome of the conversations within talent calibration is meant to define or select individuals to further help develop because of their potential within the company, as well as identifying potential success successors. Madeline, I think you're on mute. I am, you're right, thank you. <laughs> you know that's the, the, the most commonly uttered phrase for 2020, I'm talking on mute. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, so if we think about performance calibration, there's really two ways we can do it. We can do it either as part of the performance process or outside of the performance process. Can you walk us through what the considerations are either way? Oh, absolutely. So let's start with talking about if a calibration or performance calibration is not part of the process or performance process. Um, I would start by saying that it usually is recommended to initiate calibration as part of the performance process, but let's, let's go a little bit into detail as to why we would separate the two processes. So from my experience, the only reason that I would typically recommend the performance calibration being separate is if you have a unique or a smaller population to participate in calibration. Um, so if your performance eligibility does not match your calibrated eligibility, then that is a way um, or a reason that you would want to separate the two processes. Um, I would have to say that going down this route um, does involve a higher, um, pers a higher manual effort. Um, so a talent administrator would have to um, help delegate more of the process in regards of holding the reviews and making sure that the entire organization is in a similar time frame and waits for the calibrated results to potentially update um, the performance results. Um, as Sarah mentioned earlier, um, the the outputs of what is um, changed or edited within a pay for performance. Um, so if the overall rating is updated within pay for performance, it won't update within the um, overall rating and the same applies for calibration. So if the employee is dragged and dropped to a new box or a new overall rating, 
It does not automatically or dynamically update within the overall rating of a performance review. Um, so in that case, we would have to have manual effort in regards to either a talent administrator updating, updating the overall rating via an EIB or a web service or putting the ownership of a manager updating the employee review. Now, let's talk about the considerations if we do talk, um, include performance calibration as part of the work day, uh, performance process. Um, and before I go into very detailed um, explanation, I would say that Workday is continuously investing in improving the user experience within the performance process, specifically to user experience within calibration. Um, so we do have the ability like I mentioned, to launch the reviews with calibration in effort to minimize the administrator's need to intervene within the process. Um, we have uh, a new update that's part of 2020 R2, which I'm personally very excited for. I know um, it'll help a lot of my previous clients, um, but Workday has released a new service that seamlessly pauses performance reviews until calibration is complete. So for those clients that are ready live and currently calibrates during a performance review, what does that mean for you? Um, well, this update means that you can say goodbye to that passkey hold step, um, which is often configured either to a to, uh, as a to-do step or an approval step um, right after that manager evaluation step um, in efforts to, to hold the review. Um, this new um, awaiting calibration service step essentially pauses the performance review and it doesn't automatically, it, it pauses the performance review up until calibration is complete. Once calibration is complete um, and closed out, this new service will automatically resume reviews. Um, and another um, benefit of considering calibration within the process, uh, performance process, is that you do have a unique step that you can configure within the manager evaluation step. It's called update manager, uh, update manager rating for evaluation. And what that means is um, it also takes away the, the responsibility for a talent admin to intervene. So Workday, um, we can configure Workday to be smart enough um, to only send, send that step over to a manager if the calibrated rating does not match the overall rating. Um, and we could also configure a validation to require that calibrated rating to match the overall rating, otherwise a manager cannot um, submit the process. Wow, that sounds great. I know I've run into both of those problems in previous implementations. Um, we're going to turn next to communication and training, but I definitely want to make sure we come back to some of this new functionality when we talk about testing. So Zach, I'm hoping you can join me to share your thoughts about communication and training. I know from my experience, um, this is an area where, quite frankly, we seem to need a lot of communication and training. Um, honestly, I really think it's because managers just don't like to write performance reviews, no matter how easy we make it for them, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Madeline. Uh, the first point is incorporating into your communication why it's important to complete these tasks. Um, what completing reviews drives for employee growth and career progression in your communications and using different modes of communication to do so. So not just email communications, but using Workday notifications that uh, generate reminders when tasks aren't being completed to help managers and employees move the process along um, and, incom and complete their specific subtasks as part of the review process. Now, what are some of these tasks employees should be completing? prior to actually going ahead and filling out their full review. Um, this, of course, is going to depend on your process, but some things we generally see are asking employees to go in and update their talent profile uh, with any accomplishments they may have gotten during the review period, um, reviewing their goals 
and development items and updating those statuses as needed, uh, both for employees and managers. Um, if you're using competencies, reviewing those competencies and during the review re process, determining if changes are needed. Um, and if it's being requested of you, submitting feedback in Workday so it can be tracked along with the performance review. Um, and so that you know, you're able to share those commendations that you have seen from others um, in the organization very clearly uh, within the system. Thanks, Zach. That's really helpful information. So any additional comments you'd like to make before we start to talk about testing? Yeah, so one other comment is how can we make this easy and simple? For employees, in addition to just telling them, hey, we this has to get done, you know, how, how they're going to get it done is, one, just that using the system to send out notifications, reminding them of due dates and when tasks aren't completed. You know, two other components of work that you can use um, with reviews in the talent and performance area in general is help text. We find that using clear help text in system guidance drives employees along those tasks a little bit more easily. Um, and there are several tasks within the functional area uh, that do support guided tours. Those prompt or field level instructions to give um, really, really specific information on what to, what to fill in for a specific project. So some examples of those processes, um, completing feedback, session plan tasks, um, those support guided tours that you can add into the system. Again, give that additional instruction for um, employees and managers completing their reviews. All right. Thanks, Zach. So now I think we'll turn our attention back to Marcella and we'll talk a little bit about testing. It sounds to me from what I've heard, given some of the new functionality that many of our customers will need or want really to be tweaking their process this year. So in addition to the normal testing, uh, I'm sure Marcella, you're going to recommend some additional testing that we would want customers to do should they be uptaking some of this new functionality. What can you share with us about what they what we should be thinking about and how we should be preparing for that process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as part of important steps to take to properly prepare ourselves, there's 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 a number. Um, so from a, let's start with talking about a yearly maintenance. Um, so typically from um, a talent, typical talent performance implementation, um, I typically like to uh, encourage my clients to look at the following, um, starting with their performance reviews. Typically we configure those performance reviews to have a, a configured start and end date within your period. Um, so it's important to ensure that you're copying your performance reviews on a yearly basis to accurately capture those, um, those dates correctly. Another thing that I like to call out is typically looking into your eligibility and condition rules and ensuring that everything is still accurately captured based on your, uh, your organization's requirements. Um, as far as the new updates, um, definitely community is a great resource. Um, however, let's take into a consideration this, um, this new calibration update, right? Um, so the way that we would want to go ahead and move forward in making these desired adjustments is to make those adjustments in Sandbox. Um, so with that being said, all of the above is to be edited first in Sandbox um, and tested before we move it into our production environment. Um, so in this case, we would want to get rid of the to-do step or approval step in the manager evaluation and add this new service step. Um, once we go ahead and make those adjustments, um, we want to, it's important to complete um, um, an absolute complete regression testing to ensure everything is still working as expected. Um, as Workday works, um, sometimes we do a little minor tweak and it might just have a downstream effect into something. Um, so it's very important for us to have just complete testing from start to finish. Um, 
to ensure that everything is still working as expected, the designated employees are still eligible for the correct templates, um, and the condition rules are also triggering. Sometimes I've seen when copying a template, I've seen potentially a condition rule that's referencing a template, um, and since we copy it, we kind of lose that mapping to that condition rule. Um, so that is, if you if you don't have it, that could be a very easy miss. Um, so that's why testing or regression testing comes about. Another great tool um, that I like to recommend my clients is the employee review template eligibility rule. Oftentimes from year to year, eligibility might shift. Um, so it's very important before you initiate any template within your tenant to run this report. Um, it's a fantastic work they delivered resource to ensure that the, uh, the templates that you're looking for or about to initiate within your production tenant is picking up the correct population. So you can go ahead and filter accordingly just to double check that. You do not wanna be that person that initiates the template and realize one or two people fell through the crack. Um, this is just a seamless way to catch that and prevent that from happening. Okay, that's super helpful. I know for me, testing was really important when I was on the customer side doing this. Um, and and I'm, I've also seen situations where um, customers canceled things or pushed things out and they hadn't fully tested the notifications and they were yeah. caught by surprise uh, by all the notifications that went out. So that's something that I typically recommend my customers look at very carefully before they launch any large process like this in their production yeah. time. Um, so how about um, a few other considerations for testing? Um, what can you share with us um, about approach and who should be involved? Absolutely. So as far as who should be involved, I typically like to recommend that we include at least one individual um, from each said security uh, group that will be involved in the process. Obviously within Sandbox, we do have the proxy ability. Um, so an individual contributor, an employee itself, we can easily proxy in and out as those employees, but it's mm -hmm. definitely important to include those, um, those individuals that are most hands-on within the process, being mm -hmm. potentially a talent administrator, a manager, and even an HR partner, depending on how the process is configured. Um, by including these individuals, it'll help us uncover any gaps um, uh, to, to Zach's point, uh, enhance a little bit of the instructional text and might better prepare the team uh, or those, those individuals within that security group to um, answer any specific question to pertaining to the process. Great, and, thanks. Oh, more on testing? No, I was just gonna cover the next question. Go for it. Okay, so uh, another thing to keep in mind is how should we approach the testing? Um, and my biggest advice to you all is to test it all. Starting from the very beginning of your talent and performance process up until the very end. Um, to Sarah's earlier point, um, if we do have carryover or consolidate, it's very important for us to start from the goal setting process, setting a goal within your worker profile, testing your goal setting template, your mid-year template, and your annual review template, just to ensure all the necessary fields um, are populating as expected. Um, and also, once you complete your performance testing, you want to make sure and start doing some regression testing from a talent perspective just to make sure that the fields, again, are populating as you expected. Um, and another key point is to ensure that you're testing with individuals with different security privileges. Um, so an employee yourself, a manager, um, a director, depending on how your security roles are configured, uh, you want to ensure that um, nobody ever sees anything more than they're expected to. Um, during our implementation, we do a really good job in doing that. Um, it's just great to double check in case, you know, a domain changes or whatever the case might be. Yeah, I think that's a good call out. I think for me to the, you know, I'm often on the advanced comp side of this. 
So the other piece that I would point out is that if you are a pay for performance organization, you may find that one week for sandbox isn't really enough time to complete all of the tasks that Marcella is talking about and to also launch your advanced comp process. So if you have access to an implementation tenant that isn't being refreshed every week, that might be a, a good thing to, to actually test it in a tenant that's not changing every week so that you can complete some things and see them come all the way through into advanced comp. Anything else on testing, Marcella, before we turn to our tips for actually managing the process when it's live? Uh, just wanted to quickly reiterate the, the report that I mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. That report is called the Employee Review Template Eligibility Report. All right, thank you. All right, next up we have Sarah to talk a little bit more about tips for managing the process when it's actually in flight in production tenant. Yep, so um, one of the common things that we hear and that really comes up during testing is, okay, we have set up the configuration, we've made our decisions, now how do we do it? How do we make it easy for our teams to, to manage these processes? And so Workday often, you know, and all of the, the different considerations and enhancements really thinks about the user experience, not just from your employees, also from your administrators. So there's a lot of different pieces of functionality that you can put together to help build out a more robust tracking mechanism uh, based on who's going to be managing the process. Um, so from a high level, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with dashboards and worklets. Those are available to support the different processes um, that you might be implementing for your reviews. So for your performance reviews or calibration, there's a lot of delivered reports that are able to be uh, used as they are delivered um, based on what you've implemented, but also you're able to copy them and tweak them to capture specific data points that you are most interested in. Um, one of the things that's a pretty easy win um, and easy to deploy is when you configure your performance review templates, add them to the machine employee review setup menu. There's a specific section in the worklets tab so that those templates are going to show up in your performance worklets and you'll be able to track the progress of your organization's completion um, of the performance. So that's very slick, it's a very nice touch, and it's one of the things that's delivered and just very easy to use. Um, as well, one of the things that you can also think to, to deploy, and as Zach and Marcella mentioned, is that instructional text that can really help speed up the process for your users to understand how they complete the different um, sections, the different um, tasks, if they're, you know, submitting their evaluation, if they're doing a to-do or if they're approving or acknowledging it. Um, so it really helps them to understand what exactly is going through. Um, and there's multiple places to help, you know, remind them this is where you can get the job aid that we've, you know, generously put together for you. Um, so using that instructional text can help tie that all together and make sure that people are able to move through it without, you know, logging lots of questions. Um, and if they if they still are you know not completing it, you have the ability to use some delivered reporting like the business process transactions awaiting action. So you can see which performance reviews are still open. Is it still with the workers or is it with the managers? You know where is that bottleneck and how can we move it forward? Um, so you're able to copy that report too and track other you know business process you know statuses or metrics to help you understand what's the timing, how long is it taking, and in the future do you need to extend the period or start earlier so that you get the most you know response rate um, and accurate information from your workers as you can possibly can so okay. that's what you think about as you yep. think about how to make it easy for your administration your administration of the process thanks so Sarah we are almost at time so I'm wondering if um, you could just in the next minute maybe give us a little bit on considerations for mass actions um, and then we do have some questions in the chat and we will follow up with those when we publish the recording. Um, we'll make sure to answer those in the, um, the FAQ that we put out associated with that since we didn't have time to get to those. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things when you think about mass actions is, is the security and making sure that you're testing. 
You want to make sure that if you're sending back a process, you have the right groups available on the business process policies for that specific recruiting types business processes. Um, you want to make sure that you're testing in sandbox and making sure, as, as you mentioned, you know, you're testing a notification strategy. There's going to be turned off as part of the, the mass action. Is that going to be something that you do at the individual business process? If you can't turn off notifications at tenant wide for um, you know the different modules that you have currently in play um, in your system, so okay. work new, yeah, Workday has a new process called the Mass Send Back for Business Processes to help make this easier to do in Mass via an EIB web service. So I recommend checking that out as well as from the R2 release update. All right. Thank you, Sarah. That's a lot of information. And I know we actually have one last question that we'll have to answer in writing um, because we are at times. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and, um, you know, definitely appreciate the attendance and the engagement in these sessions. And if you have any suggestions for us on um, future sessions or topics that you might like to hear about, we'd love to hear from you. So feel free to let us know about those as well. Thanks again for joining today, and we hope you have a great work day.